Okay, so um, I'd like to introduce Mark Ferguson. Uh, I'm going to do this a little bit, uh, instead of reading from his bio here, I'm going to do this a little bit more, uh, I guess, informally. Um, so I know, I know Mark since 1996, when he started the PhD program at Duke, and I started my PhD program at North Carolina. So Mark, I think his degree is formally from Duke, his PhD, but he should have credit about half of it to UNC because he took something like nine to 10 classes, all the operations research classes he took at UNC. Um, so we studied together for qualifying exams. We took classes together. We socialized together during those times. Um, so I know him for quite a while. Um, and he's, before Duke, he's, uh, he has a, a BS in mechanical engineering for, from Virginia Tech and, uh, um, and also a, a math and mass in, in mechanical engineering, industrial engineering from Georgia Tech. So after that, he's, he worked at IBM for five years in, in, uh, as a manufacturing engineer and materials manager. Um, and then he got his, uh, his PhD at Duke at that time, you know, 96 to 2001. Um, and then he went to work for Georgia Tech. Um, you know, he, he got tenure there uh, and stayed there um, for some time before moving to the uh, University of South Carolina, where he's a Dewey Johnson professor and he, he was the, he's still the department chair of the management science group. Um, so Mark and I have, uh, his interesting research are in, uh, he's, he's done research at that time in his PhD, he did some research on on that, on that area of contracting supply chains, you know, when um, at the faculty there, you had people like Paul Zipkin, uh, Gerard Cachon, um, and Marie Lalivier, they were at Duke at, the, at that time. So he did some research on that. And then after that, he sort of uh, did more research on pricing and revenue management um, and um, also in sustainability. So, um, to, you know, so he, his, he has extensively published in all these areas and he has co-edited the book um, actually with me on closed loop supply chains. And also he, um, he wrote a book on pricing and revenue management as well. He was president of MSOM, of the Manufacturing Service Operations Management Society of Informs. He was president of the College of Supply Chain Management at Palms. Um, so he has done quite a bit of work um, also in the profession. Um, and in terms of in terms of awards, he won a number of awards, like two best paper awards from Palms, um, and um, and he has also has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Uh, Mark and I have also published eight papers together, uh, including three at MSOM and one at Palm, and uh, and we co-edited the book on closed loop supply chains together. So. I've worked with Mark extensively over the years in research and service um, as a friend, as a colleague. Uh, we always hang out at conferences and so on. So, um, so um, welcome, Mark. Thank you, Gil. Um, I should mention I owe a lot of my success to, to Gil. <laughs> I was the Scotty Pippen to his Jordan. <laughs> so uh, I came here uh, first, thank you for, for inviting me, but I really wanted to answer the question that everyone has is what happened to all the toilet paper in the country? And the answer is I bought it all. So that's what's behind me. I've stuffed every single room in my house with extra toilet paper and I'm selling it for $5 a roll. <laughs> but Seriously, this, you know, I kind of chose this virtual background because it does pertain to the topic I'm going to talk about today. You know, if you are a toilet paper manufacturer right now, you have really no idea what true demand is for your product. Because as soon as some, um, you know, supply hits the stores, it's gone in about 20 minutes, at least in, in our area. So you have huge what, what appears to be much more demand than, than there is supply, you really don't know what the true demand is. So let's see, I'm gonna to try to share the screen here. Is the volume okay, everyone? Okay, good. All right, so the, the topic 
as I kind of alluded to, is, is how do you estimate demand with constrained data and product substitutions? This is a topic I have really been working on for probably my whole career. And I'll give a little background. You know, back at IBM, I was on the supply side, worked at a manufacturing plant. We were given demands. We tried the best to meet them. Uh, we didn't really have much to influence those demands, at least under, under our control. But really, you know, operations management is, and supply chain management, it's about balancing supply and demand. If you think of, and especially, you know, when I was getting my PhD, these were, these were very separated topics, right? So it was kind of marketing's and sales objective to affect demand. And they had levers to do that by setting, you know, the, the four Ps, for example, price, promotion, products, placement. But what I really kind of came to realize over the years is this actually is kind of more of a operations problem than marketing. Marketing is, for the most part, primarily seems to be concerned with growing demand or figuring out, you know, the psychology behind the consumers when they make their purchases and things like that. These levers, price promotion, products placement, I mean, these are allocations of scarce resources, if you want to think of it that way, and trying to balance the supply and demand problem. We're a little more comfortable on the supply side. This has kind of been our, our history in operations. You know, and here we set things like capacity or safety stock, or maybe the sequence of production in a, in a factory. But for the most part, for a lot of our history, we just assumed, well, demand is there. Demand is some exogenous thing that's given to us and we have to figure out the most efficient way to supply that demand. And really nothing kind of encompasses this, this disconnect more than probably one of our favorite topics in operations management uh, feel the news vendor model and I'm not dishing on the news vendor model. I love the news vendor model. I probably thought about the news vendor model as much as, you know, a very small portion of the world, <laughs> but I'm going to give an example taken directly from the textbook slides of the Kishon and Turwish book for this. So if you're not familiar with the news vendor model, here's your, here's your 30 second introduction to it. So they use an example of wetsuits, this retailer of wetsuits. They sell for some price of $190. It costs them $110 to buy them. And any wetsuits at the end of the selling season, they kind of have to sell at a discount of $90. That's the salvage value. And every problem kind of gives you this. When we put it on an exam and all, we always give the students this part. It says, well, demand's normally distributed with a mean of 3,192 and a standard deviation of 1181. So does this look familiar to everybody? <laughs> I know I've given a lot of news vendor problems in my, my career. And of course, the way you solve this is you calculate an overage cost and an underage cost. So what's the cost of having too many versus the cost of having too few? And the beautiful thing about the news vendor is you can kind of reduce it down to this very simple ratio called the critical fractal, which is the cost of underage over overage plus underage. And you use that fractal to look on the demand distribution. So in this case, it's, you know, it comes out to be 80%. So we want to buy just enough of these wetsuits to meet 80% of the expected demand. So then you show your students the normal distribution table and you find where 80% is in there and you look up the Z value, which is 0.85 and that would plug into your formula and you would figure out, all right, we need to buy 4,196 wetsuits for this season. That's the optimal value. So, so I've taught this for years, but really when you go to, you know, either a, a project or a consulting assignment or something, and you're working with a company to solve this in real life, here's what you kind of quickly realize is no one tells you that demand is normally distributed with this mean and the standard deviation. 
we kind of gloss over that part when we teach the model. And over the years, what I really realized is most cases I have no idea what demand is, right? There's so many factors that influence demand. Price influences it, promotion influences it, availability influences it, substitution effects, maybe strategic actions of customers like we're seeing with toilet paper now, or buying ahead influences demand. Even that availability, like we solve our news vendor equation that says we should meet demand, you know, 80% of the time, almost like that doesn't have an effect on demand. If we only have an 80% service level, that's probably going to affect demand. <laughs> we never factor these things in. The other problem I've kind of had with our, our field is just constraining ourselves on the supply side. We're always in the reactionary mode. We're always like trying to react to something. I always like to be more on the, on the proactive side. You know, I would rather be maybe shaping demand than constantly running around trying to, to react to what demand does. So most of the materials I'm gonna talk about uh, in this, this talk, and I'm not gonna get very technical in this talk, so I'll, I'll spare you that. Uh, but if you want technical details and stuff, uh, there is a book chapter I was recently published in this series by, by Ray and Yen, uh, just came out early this spring. Uh, but I stuck my chapter on SSRN, so you don't have to pay the $110 for the book. Don't tell them that. But if you want it, um, I'll, I'm happy to share the link. So, so let's go back to the, the news vendor problem again and kind of think of it from first principles. So consider Susan here, who has a newsstand. And we're going to help her kind of make her stocking decisions. So we'll start out, Susan starts simple. She only sells newspapers. And this is kind of the problem we give in our, our classrooms. So where does this demand distribution come from? Well, typically she would start each day with maybe a hundred newspapers. And then at the end of the day, which is the 5 p.m. when the newsstand closes, she either has leftover newspapers or she's sold them all. So you can kind of see through the day, this inventory drops to, you know, either zero or some positive number at the end. And she makes some profit from this based on her cost of buying the newspapers and what price she sells them at. So she collects this over say 10 days and maybe she forms a demand distribution. And then she took one of our classes, our OM classes, so she does a news vendor calculation for that. But what's the problem with this? Well, the problem is she never sells more than 100. But that's not really demand, right? That's just what she happened to start the day with. So that's really constrained demand. And the problem with this is if you estimate your demand distribution just on constrained demand, you're gonna hit something called a, a spiral down effect because you never really observe demand greater than 100. And that means the next time you estimate your demand distribution and you apply a critical fractal to that, you're gonna stock less than 100. And then you'll do it again. Maybe you collect 10 more days of demand where you only stocked 80 at the beginning of the day. And it's just going to get smaller and smaller. You know, obviously, you know, she would figure it out eventually that something's going wrong, but this happens all the time in companies when they use sales data versus true demand data for their forecast and then apply some critical fractal inventory policy to it. You know, they will, the very danger of, of kind of getting into this spiral down effect of just stocking less and less because they think that demand is going down when really it truly isn't. So you may think, okay, well, there's a, there's a simple solution to this. Susan should just record the sales that she would have had if she had had stock. Well, think about that, right? Suppose she runs out at, three o'clock in the afternoon. Is she really gonna stand there with no newspapers to sell for two more hours and watch people come by and ask for a newspaper and record it? 
Probably not. And even if she did, you know, when someone comes by and they see that she doesn't have any newspaper, you don't know if that person would have bought or not. So it's really hard to distinguish those, you know, potential customers walking by of would they have bought a newspaper or maybe they would have saw the price and said, all right, that price is too high. So really, there, there's really no good way to actually capture um, demand in most realistic situations. And thus, we, we need some statistical techniques to try to estimate it. And this is really captured nicely in a, in a little game. My daughter was assigned this game in a math class, um, but I thought it actually was really nice. I'm gonna play it quickly. It's called a coffee shop game. It's available for free on the, on the internet. You can search for it. But in here, they go in and the students go in, they choose the number of cups of coffee, uh, the milk, the sugar, and each day they can run their stand and they can change the ingredient levels. They can change the price. And then it kind of simulates customers coming by. And the customers look at the price. Some of them buy, some of them don't buy. Some of them think the price is too high. The weather changes demand. So if it's a really cool day, you typically have a larger number of people stopping than you would. So you kind of see the, the little bubbles over the, the customers of what their decision was after they either made the purchase and he or she sold out or he can't really tell <laughs> uh, before the end of the day. So they missed some demand there. And you can play this again and again and students kind of compete with this. But there's much, much more things under their control than just the original stocking amount, right? So they can change the price, they can change, change the quality, they can forecast what the weather is gonna be. All these things we, we really don't talk about too much when we, we present these models in our class. So what can Susan do? Well, this is a really simple example. There's only one product and there are statistical techniques out there for solving problems like this. In particular, uh, one called the expectation maximization is, is used very commonly. And what the expectation maximization does without getting into a lot of details, think of separating your observations of sales into the ones that were constrained and the ones that weren't constrained. So you use your unconstrained ones that set kind of here, I'll see if I can draw on it. Yeah, here are unconstrained demands. So we're gonna actually do a complete data log likelihood function, maybe a normal distribution likelihood function, for example, to estimate some parameters for that distribution. And then we take our incomplete data and we kind of do a conditional log likelihood function using the parameters we estimated from you know, the uncensored vector and say, well, if the parameters were truly you know, this mean and this standard devi deviation, what's the likelihood that five random draws would give 100? And it's probably not going to be very likely. So this becomes an iterative method where we kind of readjust those parameter values and we do it again and again and again until it converges until you know, some acceptable level of error for us. So, so this works fine if you're only selling one product. When we get to more complex situations, we have to think of demand in a different way. So instead of just thinking of, let's just record the number sold at the end of the day, we have to think of our day broken into tiny little time periods or time slices or intervals, if you will. And with each, each, within each interval, there's a probability that a customer will arrive and then there's a probability that an arrival customer will actually make a purchase. And we really need to estimate both of those. And if you do this, you know, you can basically capture the same, you know, demand forecast that you would have the normal way. But there's, there's a particular uh, advantage to this approach as we get into more complex situations that have more than just one product. So the way to think about it, here's our little time slices. And within these time slices, there's some customers who show up and they actually make a purchase. And there's other customers who show up, but they don't make a purchase. And then you have some blank time slices where a customer didn't even show up or a potential customer didn't even show up. 
So the challenge is with these red customers here, you don't really know in a window where someone didn't make a purchase if a customer showed up or not. It's hard to distinguish someone who showed up and wanted to buy or maybe thought the price was too high versus a time slice where just no one showed up at all. So you can think of this as, you know, Susan expands. She didn't get into that spiral down effect, thankfully. Um, and she decides to actually carry a second product. Maybe she sells a newspaper and a magazine now. And these are partial substitutes. So some per people prefer a newspaper, some people prefer a magazine, but a subset of each of those groups, if one is not available, then they will purchase the other one. So here you have the same thing. You start each day, the first number there is, is newspapers. And the second one is magazines. So she starts with 80 newspapers and 50 magazines. And then at the end of the day, she ends up, you know, with either zero of each or partial inventory of, of one or both. And this problem was actually studied back in 1998 when I was a PhD student. I remember reading this paper. It was a marketing science paper. Um, and the, the authors were actually very clever. Kind of the way they approached this is they assign probabilities for all these different outcomes. So kind of neighbor product A or B stock out, product A stocks out, and then B gets some spillover demand or only B stocks out. And they, they use this in a clever way to kind of estimate what the, what the arrival rate of customers uh, was. And then what each of these corresponding probabilities is. And it gets pretty complex um, with their approach and it's very, very difficult to expand this beyond two products. So what happens when you have more than two products? Most retail outlets you can think of out there or travel hospitality settings have more than two products. Even as Susan just added one third product or, you know, a third different products, say a book now. So she sells a newspaper, a magazine, and a book, and these are all partial substitutes. Now you're getting into, you know, a situation where she had stayed with the independent demand models. You could get into really bad estimates of what true demand is for each one. And we face this same problem in the kind of travel hospitality area, which is the area where revenue management has focused uh, most of it's, it's work. So think of a hotel with different rooms. So one has a lagoon view, another one's a king bed junior suite, another one's a one bedroom suite. Yeah, most upper scale hotels have multiple products and they try to figure out what the true demand is for, for each of these room types. Even in a airline selling coach seats, you know, there's, there's different products because they group them into different fare classes. And historically, the way revenue management started, we kind of assumed that there was independent demand for each of these. So if you bought a room type two, it was assumed that that was your only choice and you would never buy a room type three or a room type one, even if room type two was not available. So, you know, those of us who teach kind of introductory revenue management, we do the same news vendor formula, the same independent demand assumption. Um, you, know, you have your estimated demand and you figure out how many room type twos you should make available. As the research has progressed and actually industry um, practices have progressed too, they started using more sophisticated forecasting models like choice modeling for situations like this. So choice modeling, the way it first was implemented, you kind of just assume that the number of customers were the ones that bought from your portfolio of products. So really this no purchase option was not really there in the earlier choice modeling. And customers would come in, they look at prices, they look at the portfolio and they choose among that, that set of options. So either room type one, type two, or type three, your choice model would estimate a, a probability for buying either one, you know, any one of those three. 
And you could estimate these even if your data included time periods where some of these were not available. As the science progressed, you know, we started being able to handle more sophisticated situations. You know, so if some products in the portfolio are not available for long time periods and also including this no purchase option. But what this really does is means that in addition to the actual choice model, you also have to estimate kind of a separate arrival rate. So what's the market potential, if you will, of number of customers who would potentially buy, in this case, from, from a hotel. And some of them, you know, you will lose to your competition. If they're potential customers, they come in to look at your portfolio and your prices, and they go and they buy from somewhere else. And there's about four different um, techniques that have been developed through the years most of it in the last 10 years, I would say, uh, for, for estimating these choice models and the arrival rates, if you will. So this is not an exhaustive list, but you know, this is a good place to start if you're, if you're interested in this work. But all of these still have kind of an interesting trade-off in that they treat all customers the same you know, as if every customer is kind of homogeneous because there's one choice model for, for all the customers. Um, I'm co-author on a, a paper that kind of falls into this count. We have a, one of the latest ones in this area called it Robust Demand Estimation of Choice Models for Personalized Offers Using Sales Transaction Data. This is available on SSRN as well. And lead author there is one of our doctoral students, Sengun Sho. But if you, if you really want to use these models for kind of the, say, latest and greatest practices that, that we're seeing in, in retail and hospitality, you know, everyone talks about personalized pricing. And personalized pricing is kind of treating customers heterogeneously, right? You're saying each customer is slightly different, or at least there's clusters of customers that kind of have different willingness to pay. So you know, these, these models and papers and all that I've talked about really haven't solved this problem yet. In the hospitality industry or, you know, travel industry, you know, we see this all the time, kind of everybody paying slightly different price for basically the same product. But to, to do this, we need this kind of third dimension up here which is not assuming that all customers are homogeneous. We need heterogeneous clusters and we need to estimate when a customer arrives, what cluster they fall into. And this could be based on their customer characteristics or their booking attributes, or maybe some external factors. So there's our choice probabilities down there you know, that our choice models estimate, but we also need an uh, estimate for any arrival falling into a particular cluster, and each cluster will have a separate choice model. So you can think of it more like, like this flow. So we start with the guest attributes or the travel attributes or whatever other attributes we, we may have in our data set. We assign historically the number of people who have purchased our products into different clusters. And we actually are doing a, a mixture cluster with this. And this is, I should mention, joint work now with uh, Oracle Machine Learning Lab that we're working on with this. And then each of these clusters kind of has their own multinomial logit model on how they would choose between our portfolio of products, in this case for a, for a hotel. So i wrap up here. I know I'm kind of running out of the 30 minutes and I want to save time for questions. But two of our doctoral students, Justin and Sang Hoon, are going to be our, our means for this example. So Justin comes in. You can actually tell a lot from a customer by just what they kind of request. 
So Justin comes in, he's booking one week in advance. He's looking to stay nine days, has two adults, has children, is traveling on a holiday, maybe as part of the rewards program for the hotel, and he books over the web, versus Sangoon has very different attributes. So the first thing we do is we use our, our mixture model to assign the probability that both Justin and Sanghoon would fall into our pre-existing clusters. And we've, used, we've developed those clusters based on our, our past sales and attributes of the cu customers that have booked with us in the past. So we kind of see Justin has a higher probability of being a cluster two customer and Sanghoon has a higher probability of being a cluster one. So there's those probabilities again. What we can learn because we've pre-defined these or pre-estimated these clusters is based on this um, probabilities of being in each, in each cluster, we can translate that to probabilities of the room types that they will be most interested in. You know, so Justin's more interested in the suite. He's traveling with his family. He's traveling on holiday. Sanghoon may appear more like a business traveler, probably is just interested in the superior room. You know, and you can kind of see the no purchase probability for, for each of those is different. We may also infer some other things like Justin prefers a water view and a larger room size, maybe twin beds versus Sanghoon prefers a city view, maybe a smaller room, maybe king bed. So what do we do with this? Well, you know, we, we can infer from all of these models a preference list. And we can use this preference list in a number of ways. You know, one, it improves our forecasting. So just figuring out if we have, you know, some, um, some leeway over the supply, then we can try to tailor the supply to a better fit forecast. We can do some target marketing to these different customers. So let's say we know that we are running short of superior rooms, but we're going to have a lot of suites left. Maybe we target our marketing towards, you know, Justin's clusters, if you will. We can actually use this to figure out what sequence we want to display offers to. You know, so when you go to a hotels.com or a booking.com or something, there's a, there's an algorithm in the background that, says, okay, what order should I show these options? And of course, customized pricing, you know, that's kind of the, the holy grail, um, but also you have to be very careful there with customized pricing that, you know, customers are not perceiving that they're being um, charged or, or presented with higher prices just because of attributes that they can't really control. So at least with the hotel partners, you know, we've talked to and, and Oracle works with and all, they tend to, you know, be more excited about the first three and the last one, which is potential for upselling recommendations. So maybe you know that Justin really, you know, um, prefers that water view. So after he books the suite, maybe you can, there, there could be an upsell opportunity to say, hey, for a few extra dollars, you can get a water view. So what I've tried to do is kind of take you from the very, very simple to kind of where we are today uh, in terms of estimating these demand distributions with increasingly sophisticated models to try to make them a little more realistic at, at each step. And finally at the end, kind of show you what the end goal is, at least in the travel hospitality um, industry. So the same thing is happening in, in retail, you know, especially with the online retailers like Amazon, you know, they are using very, very similar techniques to try to determine things like, you know, your, um, what items are presented to you when you do a search and, you know, customers who frequently bought this, bought this and those type of things and the prices that they, they present to you. So with that, I will stop and open it up for, for questions.
Okay, uh, Mark, I'm uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with a question. Actually, I have a couple, <laughs> but I, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with. Uh, I think the first one is about implementation of these discrete choice models. Um, so I'm so from what I've heard uh, in the airline industry, I have have friend at American Airlines, and he says they converted a lot of their forecasting to discrete choice. Um, you know a few years ago. So I, it seems like hospitality, airlines, and all the traditional revenue management types of, uh, of, of industries are really applying this kind of stuff. But what, is, what do you see, is that true for other industries? Think about um, other physical retailers. I, I can see some potential in online retailers, but physical retailers and other industries, can you comment on that? Um, and then I just have a second one because I'm just so curious about this, uh, which is about, you know, you mentioned the personalized pricing, right? And, and then um, you said, well, they, they're less interested on this. Um, and, and I think, you know, either by consumer backlash, uh, because people may perceive that they're being, you know, charged more, but not only that, but I, I question about what the legality of that is, uh, you know, in which case it is legal, which case it is not legal, what kinds of attributes can you use, what kind of attributes could you not use? So I wish you could comment on that. And uh... Sure. So I'll start with the, say, brick and mortar retailers. Um, where these models have probably been applied the most frequently in that setting is in the assortment planning. So figuring out the initial assortments, you know, for a brick and mortar store, you've only got limited shelf space. You're trying to figure out how many brands of toilet paper you want to put on it, right? Right now, it doesn't matter. You put anything out there, it'll sell. Um, but they, they have been used there for a while. You're starting to see it in kind of deciding on price optimization, you know, um, especially promotional pricing and, and avenues like that. Uh, but the advantage that the travel hospitality industries have versus especially the brick and mortar retailers is they kind of observe what's available and what's not available, or it's easier for them to observe versus a brick and mortar store. You don't necessarily know when you stock out of an item, you know, unless you have people constantly going up and down the aisles to, to record, when an item has been stocked out. So I think that's one reason it's been uh, a little slower in that, that particular um, industry. And in terms of the legality, um, so as long as you are, well, this, this, I am not a lawyer, so take everything with a <laughs> grain of salt, right? <laughs> But as long as you are not using um, attributes like sex, ethnicity, um, race, you know, these obviously very, very sensitive and controversial attributes that customers cannot change, um, then there, there hasn't been many challenges legally on customized pricing. Now, just because there's not a legal challenge doesn't mean that there's not a social backlash. And, you know, Amazon ran, it ran into this many years ago. They were kind of experimenting and charging different customers different prices for CDs that can give you an idea of, or DVDs, give you an idea of how long ago it was, right? Um, you know, and, and the media kind of found out about it and they got a lot of bad press. So they're, they're very, very kind of hesitant um, to at least publicly say they're doing anything around customized pricing today. And a lot of the firms are as well. Uh, there's, there are ways you can get around that. And, you know, for example, you can offer customized discounts. So that seems to be more accepting or people accept it more. Uh, especially if it's something they feel like they have some control over, you know, so I could have gotten a bigger discount, but I didn't want to, you know, book that far early in advance, or I, I wanted the flexibility or, you know, I wanted, um, 
you just didn't want to take the time to go through the hoops to, to get it or something like that. I think we have a question from VJ now. VJ, could you uh, go ahead? Please. Yeah, sure. Um, Mark, this was uh, really, really interesting. <clears throat> I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I was, uh, I really uh, was thinking about the paper with Oracle Academy, where you had you were first forming clusters of customers based upon some characteristics of customers, and then overlaying demand char characteristics on top of it. Uh, but the demand characteristics, for example, uh, substitutes could actually intertwine or interact with customer characteristics like family size. So in light of this, what kinds of questions are you exploring in the future? I was curious about that. Yeah, that's, that's a great uh, question, BJ. I mean, we have gone back and forth on that many times of where is the right point in that kind of decision tree, if you will, to introduce certain attributes. And the way we're doing it right now is we're just trying multiple levels and see kind of based on the historical data, where does it fit the best? So we were using kind of misclassifications as a, as a, one of our main metrics and you know, what um, sequence there of introducing the attributes is that the cluster is that the, you know, choice model gives us the, the least amount of misclassification. Um, I, I have another question. So while, while people haven't, having the please you know, if other people please jump in i have a question about the price optimization again interested in the sort of a more practical aspects of that right so um what what are the what are the price optimization i mean when i think about discrete choice modeling you think oh well given these prices these attributes these are the choice probabilities right and so i multiply that by some customer arrival thing and then i have uh, for the different clusters, then I have the expected demand, and and so how how you know how would that I mean how would you have the sensitivity of the price probabilities to the prices? I guess that's the question, and and uh, whether or not they're, they're doing these kind of things. So so some of the existing methodology doesn't include price as a variable. Um, you know, just kind of looking at these uh, papers right here. The original Tellurian Van Ryzen did include price. Um, the Volcano paper didn't. The Newman paper did. I guess I should use checks. Uh, this one did not. And this one doesn't really either. So, so the ones that don't include price just assume that there's kind of a ranked order preference on customers and that that ranked order preference doesn't change. So that's, that's probably okay in a situation where the prices don't change, but many situations where the prices do change, then your, your preferences for a certain product will, will change. So, you know, uh, if we change the price, say, of room type two from $200 to $100, then all of a sudden people who might have preferred room type one would now, a lot of them would probably refer, prefer room type two because the value that provides is, is greater. Um, so that's why it's so important to have price as an attribute. Now, when you go to actually do price optimization, it gets a little tricky because one, one bit of science we don't really have very well developed, at least in our field is correcting for price endogeneity in a choice model estimation. You know, we can, we can do it for linear demand, um, but the, you know, the science is, is not as developed in estimating choice models and correcting for price endogeneity. And that's, that's something that's probably gonna have to be solved before you can really use these models for price optimization. Cool. Um, yeah. Uh, do we have time for just a quick question? Yeah. Uh, 
this hi Mike, this is Owen. Um, so just a really general question. Do companies have enough data to use the methodology that uh, you know our research field has proposing? I understand that big companies can do it, but can small to medium companies start to doing this now? Uh, great question, Owen. Um, data is always a challenge. Obviously, the more data and the richer data, the, the better your forecasting model. But uh, you know, the way I always answer this in, in class is, what's your alternative? So I wouldn't use lack of data as an excuse. I mean, any forecasting model, when I teach forecasting, I say you're your benchmark is, you know, just take a mean and a standard deviation, <laughs> right? You know, everybody has a mean and a standard deviation of what they think demand is, or they, they should have something they can estimate that from. So does your forecasting model reduce the amount of variation over just the, the regular standard deviation you estimate? And you can do this with all levels of forecasting. So as you go to a different level of sophistication, is it really worth it or not? I always see, well, does it reduce the error enough to justify the you know, increased uh, complexity? Um, okay, Vijay, I think we are, we are on time now. Is that correct? Thank you very much, Gil, and thank you very much, Mark. Really appreciate it. And uh, so Rachel will be breaking out rooms and she will be breaking us in random rooms. So just not to surprise you, so, but again, you're not ra random in the sense you will be amongst friends. You will, uh, you will find people that you already know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for the applause, Kyle. <laughs>